Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Alina Islam, and I'm a mining analyst here at Red Cloud Securities. I'm very pleased to introduce Kootenay Silver to you today, a junior exploration company focused on the discovery and development of silver deposits in Mexico. Kootenay has successfully discovered three deposits with resources to totaling 214 million ounces silver equivalent in the MI categories plus another 54.9 million ounces silver equivalent in the inferred category. The company has one of the largest junior owned silver resource bases in Mexico and is currently focused on its flagship Columba project where a 5,000 meter drill program is underway. For the webinar today, we have with us Jim McDonald, president and CEO. Jim will provide an introduction to the company, including an overview of activities currently underway at its projects. After the presentation, we'll take your questions live. Please send us your questions via the chat box and we'll get through as many as we can. Before we get started, I do need to mention the fine print. For Kootenay Silver, there may be some forward-looking statements made on this webinar. I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of the Kootenay corporate presentation located on the company's website. For Red Cloud Securities, I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Please see our most recent research located on our website for Kootenay Silver specific disclosures. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Jim. Please take it away. Okay. Thanks, Elena. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, appreciate everybody coming to uh, listen to the Kootenay story and either learn it for the first time or get an update. Um, Kootenay Silver is focused on the discovery of silver deposits in Mexico. And uh, we've been at it for some time and we've made several discoveries and totaling a pretty large resource base now with three different discoveries that we've had and the forward looking statements to be aware of, which Alina highlighted already. So when investors come to Kootenay Silver, they, they look at a, a couple of things. There's two basic aspects. We, we have one of the largest junior owned silver resource bases in Mexico, which gives us a big leverage to the silver price alone. And you can see that in our, in our price action correlated with the silver price itself. That's one aspect. The other aspect is the explosive upside potential from new discoveries that we offer. And we're indeed in the middle of a new discovery here on the uh, high grade Columba project, which has become our focus over the last uh, three and a half, four years. And so these two things give us a lot of leverage to the silver price and a, a great potential for a re-rating. Uh, the share structure, as you can see here, uh, current price is around $1.10. Uh, outstanding is issued, about $60 million now. And then a market cap of around $66 million and the average daily volume over the last three months, about uh, just shy of $170,000 shares a day. Um, we just finished a financing here, closed on 2.35 million uh, last week. And uh, we're, so we're sitting with quite a strong treasury to uh, move ahead with our corporate objectives here, which is basically to get ourselves to a maiden resource on the Columba project. Uh, key shareholders, you can see Eric Sprott, Condire, um, management directors, institutions in, includes a a high net worth and managed money and uh, resource fund money, uh, mainly out of Switzerland, uh, but not uh, exclusively. Uh, former investments from major mining companies in the past are a testament to the success we've had with the drill bit and, and discovery. These are not shareholders at the moment, but they've all invested because of different discoveries we've made. Core mining because of the La Ciguera discovery, uh, one of our resource uh, projects. Ignigo Eagle because of our original promontorial uh, resource discovery. And then Pan American because of a second resource discovery on the promontorial property we call La Negra. 
So the, the focus here is on our high-grade discovery at Columba uh, project. Uh, we've been drilling there for about three years now. We've, uh, at the end of the last round of drilling, we had over 30,000 meters of drilling done in 145 holes. And then this is all backed by our resource properties, uh, which total 100, 214 million ounces of silver equivalent and another 50 in the measured indicated and another 54.9 million in the inferred. Uh, th these are hosted in the Promontorio, La Negra and La Ceguera projects. And last year um, we updated the, uh, the Promontorio uh, resource report to include the La Negra discovery, which we hadn't done before, and also to update the Promontorio uh, resource as well. Uh, to bring it up to uh, current pricing in uh, metals and uh, costs. Then in January, we announced an updated La Ceguera resource uh, with a new geologic model. We demonstrated that we had a significant grade bump there from 85 grams in a constrained open pit to 102 grams in the measured and indicated categories. So uh, this whole... Uh, Company is also backed by a, you know, a consistent exploration program we run on the ground looking for new opportunities, either brand new discoveries that we make on the ground or uh, uh, properties that we can acquire that we see good potential for. And that's basically how we've made all our discoveries uh, to date through that process. And the the projects sit in all of northern Mexico. The high-grade Columba project that we're drilling right now sits in the northern extension of the famous Sierra Madre trend, which is depicted in the, by the red line. That's the mineral belt that hosts many of the major silver mining districts in Mexico, including Peral, which <laughs> sits here in the upper middle of the image, and uh, right here. And that's where the La Ceguera a resource sits and it is um, in the in the famous Pearl district and then the other resource project in southern Sonora is uh, Promontorio La Negra. And so with um, the 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 focus on Colombo, all our work is really centered around that other than those resource updates. And with the new financing, we are in a position to continue our stage 50,000 meter drill program. We were already underway on the next 5,000 meters of that stage program uh, when we fo uh, financed uh, their closing last week. And now this financing puts us in a position to expand that 5,000 meters to a 20,000 meter program, which we believe is enough to get us to a maiden resource uh, results uh, uh, supportive of that. So let's get on to describing the Colombo project here. Uh, as I've mentioned about three times, high grade silver uh, discovery here is classic vein system, classic Mexican vein system high grade. We got introduced to this project just over four years ago, picked up an option during 100% and did that um, last May, about just about this time last year, we made our final payment for 100% of the project. There were two periods of historic mining here in the early 1900s that culminated in 1910 with the Mexican Revolution stopping operations. And then again, in 1958, 1960, some uh, very small scale mining occurred. And it, were, it was the records, the assay records from the underground development that was done in the early 1900s that got us really interested in the project because it showed some very consistent high grades on a number of different levels. There was a shaft there put down 200 meters at that uh, early period, early 1900s, and six um, levels or tunnels put off of that shaft. And the assays out of there showed some really consistent high-grade numbers um, coming out of the old mine. And so we picked up the option based on that. We couldn't get in because the mine's flooded, uh, but we 
could see enough evidence at surface to give us some confidence you know, that there were accurate assays. And that certainly proved to be true when we went and started drilling. And th that vein was called what we call now call the F vein. But what we found is not, uh, the, the F vein did, it does indeed host high grade intercepts like those old assays said. Uh, we now have over 40 holes on that vein Con defining consistent uh, mineralization on that vein across uh, 700 meters of strike down to a 200 meter vertical depth, still open to depth and uh, still in some real nice high grade at, at depth as well. But then what we also found is a number of the other veins that show themselves at surface uh, grade even better and better, uh, better and wider widths. You know, for example, 17.8 meters is 650 grams per ton, 6 meters is 2,000 grams per ton, and the real highlight hole so far, 34 meters a half kilo. And so a lot of potential here showing up, and that 34 meters a half kilo is in our D vein where we're drilling now. And uh, at the culmination of last fall's program, we defined over 450 meters of strike length on that vein, and down to depths of 250 meters. And that highlight hole is the deepest hole on the vein so far. And so now, um, let's move ahead here, the next slide. And uh, here I just want to point out that, I'm not sure how to erase those hole markings. Oh, they're gone. So th this, these are the veins in, in yellow. So this vein system sits in an old volcano, and you see that's the rim of the old volcano there. There's the bottom of the cone down here. Here's the old shaft in the upper left, and that's the erosional low here. And so that erosional low is just barely exposed. The top part of the veins where they become productive, strong, consistent veins with good grades. When you walk up the sides of the hills in any direction, you start to lose the vein. You'll walk it right on into what uh, what we call a breccia, a broken silicified rock. And the silver values will drop down to basically background in some cases. But yet when you drill down to at least that erosional level and deeper, the vein is still there. So what that tells us is whatever was deposited here originally is still here. This, is, this system's almost entirely preserved. And it also allows us to understand exactly where we are. We're at the very tip top of it. So geologically, this is uh, very exciting to, to know that going in. And, and it's a textbook case uh, and uh, a great place for uh, field school, actually, for these type of deposits. Uh, the other thing to point out is uh, from upper left to lower right, that's four kilometers and three kilometers in the opposite direction. So we're getting some very significant size here. And when we compare the size of this vein system to other more advanced projects and discoveries over the past few years, we compare very well for systems that can produce 100 million ounces of silver or in resources or, or greater or multiples of that. So we are on the right-hand side. And the red dots are there are drilled areas. And then in the middle is the Coppola discovery, Vizsla, now over 300 million ounces there. And then on the left-hand side is the Las Chispas mine now in production uh, with Silvercrest. So we certainly have the scope for something that could be very large. And we're seeing, in addition, not just to the scope, we're seeing the grade. And I just want to point out here that um, the shaded areas that you see here and through here and to the side there, that narrow little sliver, though that's what we don't uh, own currently, but everything else we do. And so here's our vein systems, all the different veins labeled. In the middle here, you see the you see the historic F vein. We've got 700 meters of consistent high grade there. Some very good numbers showing up, as you can see, some good widths as well. Also, some hang there's two other veins there. There's a hangwall vein and a footwall vein. And the hangwall vein is getting up to 
2,000 grams per ton over a couple of meters in places. So the, those don't even come to surface. So that was something additive and new. And then uh, over uh, on the uh, right-hand side here, we're seeing 44 meters of uh, over 300 grams of six meters of 2,000 grams per ton. And uh, so lots of good numbers over there in that what we call the J vein area. And then where we're focused, let's zoom in on the D vein and the B vein. Uh, the B vein is, is very lightly drilled. It looks like it's the extension of the F vein. You see it in the lower part of the image here where the 13 meters of 400 grams per ton is and the 4.6 meters of almost 1,200 grams per ton at the bottom of the image. That's the B vein. And adjacent to that, it is the D vein, which is uh, we've got quite a few holes into now. It's got the most exciting intercepts in terms of consistent width and, and uh, grade here. You can see the 29 meters of over 400 grams with the almost 1800, 18 meters of 650 grams, and then that 34 meters a half kilo, uh, 90 meters below it. So just very uh, exciting vein here. And these vein systems will typically have one or two or three of the structures that will have big mineralized shoots that hold the vast majority of the ounces in the vein system. And that's very classic of, of these vein systems. And it looks like that D vein, we believe, could be one of those key structures to really build up the ounces and make all the other ones work. And so we'll just run through a couple long sections here on the F vein. This is a historically worked one. Uh, just what I want to point out here is that right from the uh, left-hand side, you can see here we're over 800 grams per ton over a couple meters. Uh, to the far right, we're still at a couple meters nearly of over 400 grams per ton over there. And then even at depth, we're remaining open there with over 2,000 grams per ton in hole 121. And then in hole 123, a meter of over 700 grams, which was within a you know, broader three meter interval of good grade as well. So very consistent across the whole length of 700 meters. Um, we've got enough drilling here to know there's a resource. Uh, there will be some infill in these gaps, obviously, that we'd want to do before we get to a resource calculation. Uh, but we know there's a resource there to be defined. And so moving on to the D vein, uh, this is where our best results have been to date. And we're looking at almost a 500 meters of strike here from one hole, hole 136 on the right-hand side to, to way over in 147 on, on the, or uh, 136 on the left, 147 on the right. But what to point out here is the erosional level that you need to get to before you see, or the level you need to get to before you see good grade is roughly the 1750 meters, which is on that line there. Above that, you can hit the vein or you can hit the structure, but you won't necessarily have any values these shallow holes at the top 129 133 hit the vein but no values then you got a little deeper you start to pick up 100 grams 200 grams 300 grams then when you're into 147 there now you're into eight meters of 500 grams core length next hole 10 meters of 500 grams with a high core of over two kilos and three and a half percent lead zinc in that case so very classic. This thing's almost entirely preserved from erosion. So you really want to get down to that, that level and deeper. And so you see right from the far left side, we're in good grade, all, one, hole 136. There, hole 138 was almost 14 meters and nearly 600 grams per ton with a real nice high-grade core to it. And then the um, best hole so far is that uh, hole 125 with a 34 meters a half kilo with real uh, core of it was nearly 10 meters to 1700 grams per ton still still open and uh, adjacent to it 
either side, real good grades and wits again. And the thing's just open long strike, end of depth. And what we embarked on last uh, fall uh, were these holes, uh, sort of uh, one, these holes that went from uh, sort of one, uh, 139 up uh, to uh, 147 there, expanding on the foot, uh, the footprint of drilling that we had originally. So now what we're doing is just basically, I'll skip the B vein here, is uh, basically a consistent step out here of uh, drill fences, moving along strike. We embarked on that uh, four weeks ago. So we're, we're pretty close, one or two weeks away from getting some assays out and, on the first few holes. And so what we've done here now is um, we are, I see some markings. I don't know if you guys do. There we go. <laughs> And now they're gone. Okay, so here's the end of last fall. There's the envelope of drilling we defined. Now we're stepping off here at uh, sort of 50 to 100 meter intervals. We started here with close space bit drilling to get our vein oriented. And now we're more aggressively stepping off at roughly 100 meter centers like this to see how far this mineral goes. And then we'll come back, start to infill and do fences and go deeper on, on this vein. And so when we look at the adjacent B vein, it's very similar to the D vein in story. Uh, here at surface, you're too high in the system, hole 130, you hit the, you hit the structure, but no values. Then you start getting a little deeper. You got um, 46 grams and 200 grams, and now you're up to 600 grams in this hole. And then down here, you're getting into some real nice grades in these two holes here, up to over a kilo or a couple meters and nearly 1,200 grams over 4.6 meters. So part of what we'll be doing on this expanded program is just systematic drilling of, of this vein as well along strike. And so uh, that's where we are now. So we're expanding our current 5,000 meter program into 20,000 meters. And that's, we believe enough it is to a maiden resource depending on the results. And so that's what we're shooting for. And we hope to have that by the end of the year. Uh, this is just a plan map of our next uh, bunch of holes following the D-Vein. And I've uh, spoken to this long section on the D-Vein already. And that uh, brings us to full circle on, on what we're doing at Columba. Now, um, secondary catalysts here uh, are our resource projects. So uh, in the case of La Ciguera, we did the update here on the resource, we got a very recent update, bumped the grade from 85 grams to, to 102 grams. So when you start to get a little bit higher silver price approaching $30, this project starts to look really interesting like it could potentially make it. There's a lot of upside here. I just want to point out that this is in uh, the famous uh, Perel District of Mexico, and we have a large land package on the extension of this area to the south, which is Santa Barbara, San Francisco, Del Oro. Grupo Mexico is still mining there today at 2,000 meter depth. The La Ciguera Resort sits up here, right up there, and it comes right to surface. It's pit constrained. And our deepest holes, for the most part, are uh, less than 150 meters vertically from surface. So there's a lot of potential here. This main structure we can follow for 10 kilometers until it disappears into valley cover here as it heads towards that district to the south. So we've got a, a tremendous number of targets here. That structure outside of the resource is pretty lightly drilled. And, and we updated the resource and we got this great grade bump, which will help economics. And then we've just got this 
project position to be able to move ahead when we get into a, a real strong silver bull market, uh, the kind of market that will pay uh, for, uh, you know, pay to spend money here. In other words, where spending money is going to be appreciated in the market. And, I, you know, it looks to us like we're entering the very early stages of a silver bull market here. And, uh, you know, and we see that coming. Same kind of story with Promontorio La Negra. We um, updated the resource there to include the La Negra discovery, which is shown in this image. So that La Negra discovery is what got Pan American really excited to in invest in this in a number of years ago now. Uh, because of the grades that we were seeing, and the dis one discovery hole was a uh, um, included 50 meters of 450 grams per ton silver and, and averaged about 150 grams over 200 meters from surface. So the, the average ended up being around 126 at a 40 gram cutoff. And uh, Pan American was going to take that all the way into production uh, and leave us with 25%, provide all the capital for building a mine. If La Negra got to 50 million ounces, now it didn't, it got to about half that. So, but even so, it's got real nice metallurgy. That's the mineral body, forms the hill. Uh, so it lends itself to um, nice open pit mining. The metallurgy done so far is uh, looks pretty straightforward. A simple leach. You get really good recoveries uh, from low 80s to low 90s. And uh, so it's the kind of project that in, in a stronger silver uh, price and the right kind of operator uh, could be a very nice uh, high margin producer for somebody. So we've just updated our resource there to in include the resource numbers for La Negra and, uh, and get it positioned for the strong silver market that we see coming. I'll touch on uh, board and management now. Um, I'm a geologist by training and uh, was gotten into the junior uh, resource side of the business in uh, 1988 or 1987, just after the market crash, and um, and have been involved in that end of the business ever since in various different companies and starting up different different companies along the way. Uh, the most significant of which was National Gold, where we bought an out-of-the-money gold deposit in the year 2000 from Placer Dome Kennecott called, called Mulattoes in Sonora, and that was my introduction to uh, Mexico. Long and short of that is we brought in uh, John McCluskey and Chester Miller to help us finance that with their, with their company called Alamos Minerals, merged the companies in 03 to form Alamos Gold, and then I stepped off that board in 2012. Uh, then we, uh, Ken Berry is the uh, chairman of, uh, of Kootenai, and he's the founder and CEO of Northern Vertex. He took that moss mine in from resource early resource stage to production in about four years in, in Arizona. Raj Kang, our, our CFO, Joe Jufri, uh, he's a former legal officer for Nevsun, and then we have John Mortar, who was the former CFO from Alamos, Tony Retta uh, of uh, Kamenak fame and CEO of Tectonic. Uh, advisors, Tiziano Romanoli and Hans Smith. And um, Tom Richards, our, our uh, an advisor and former VP of Exploration, and Dale Britley, our current VP of Exploration, just joined us uh, about a year and a half ago. And so the thing to really point out here is that uh, for a junior re, uh, junior company, we've got excellent breadth of experience here. We're going right from literally the grassroots prospecting stage of exploration all the way up into resource definition and mine building and mine operations with our experience and, the, and then the financing of every one of those stages. So really well-rounded board in terms of experience. So this is bringing us out, uh, rounding out the presentation here, um, full circle. So we're, we're offering here one of the largest junior owned uh, silver asset bases with the current resources that we have. And then we're busy 
focusing our efforts on the, the drill program at Colombo to get ourselves to maiden resource there. Exciting, classic, high-grade vein uh, system. And so I think this sets us up for uh, in a great position for adding a lot of value, first through the drill bit, and then secondly, through the silver price. So that uh, closes us out here and we can take uh, take questions. Well, thanks a lot, Jim. Uh, that was a great presentation. So we can get started with the Q&A portion of the webinar. Just as a reminder to our participants, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. So, Jim, we've got a couple of questions here already. Uh, I'll start off with the first one. Um, so is the medium-term objective here to continue to de-risk the project until it is attractive as a takeover target, or do you want to build a mine yourself? Yeah, our objective is to, is to sell. And we've got the expertise to be able to build a mine ourselves, but kootenai has been set up from the beginning as a, a discoverer, and so our objective is to build this up and, and sell. Okay. So what are some of the major obstacles that you need to overcome in the next 12 to 18 months? So well, the big, the big uh, objective here is to get to a maiden resource. And, um, and then uh, move on from there. We'll see what that maiden resource looks like. I expect there'll be lots of expansion potential at that point. And then if it's all positive, we'll be going on to a PEA. Uh, so I can read some of these. Um, your, for instance, there's a question on uh, infrastructure as well. So really, the infrastructure is actually quite good here. We're, we are just uh, a 15-minute drive off of the highway uh, that goes to the capital city of Chihuahua, Ciudad de Chihuahua. And it's about a three-hour drive from the airport there to the edge of the project, and then another 15-minute uh, drive into in, into the camp in the heart of the project. Uh, to, in the little caldera that we sit in, at the base of it is agricultural land, quite flat. There's power right up to the base of that uh, mountain now, and uh, a local town, which is a probably at least 50,000 people in size, you know, you know, get, has all the supplies that we need. So then uh, I see here as well that uh, political interference, well, you know, that could be a factor. We've uh, seen the reform here that AMLO brought in. Uh, we've been challenged in various uh, there and Peros, but not one of the bias, but almost every junior company and, and mining company down there, they're quite overwhelmed with it. We've, we've been granted a number of our Imperos, which are a stay on the law. And then the um, opposing political parties have launched their own challenge, which goes directly to the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court uh, rules in their favor that if the law was unconstitutional, it would be completely struck down. Yeah, so that's where we stand with regards to that. Um, the existing con registered concessions we have are not impacted that greatly, and we were able to just continue working as, as we have uh, before. I apologize. I had some technical difficulties, so my laptop shut down. <laughs> um, I see you started going through um, some of the questions on the chat already. Yeah. Are there any outstanding, Jim? Because I've sort of lost. Um, okay, we're. Most. I'm just seeing the last one is political situation. I just talked about that. Okay. Um, so uh, I don't see any after that right now. Okay. Um, I've got a few more. Um, I guess if, if we can talk about Promontorio, uh, La Negra and La Cigarra. So you recently updated the resource for that. Um, at what silver price do you see those deposits become compelling? Mm -hmm. but at, at, um, in the case of La Cigarra, something close to $30 starts to look pretty interesting on a paper financial model, um, especially with that little grade bump. 
And La Negra, potentially as well. Uh, over 30 for, you know, over 30 is certainly going to make those projects really interesting. It's a good way to get a sustained price in that range. And then the promontorial project itself will require something that's higher. Uh, it's a lower grade polymetallic uh, project. But I, I think that, you know, La Negra's got excellent grade it's just smaller so it needs a smart operator who could build uh with low capital cost amortize those ounces and then in the case of la ceguera you know you, there's a lot of upside potential there we see even inside the constrained pit uh potential for pretty significant ounce uh, increase there's a gap what we call gap zone in there that was not drilled off and uh, then the trend itself and when you get uh, around 30 and then better it that grade starts to look pretty you know pretty interesting so you know our objective is to get those moved when we get into a strong silver market here when a money can be raised and b money spent there is going to be adding value and and, and be meaningful Okay, so I guess on that note, you know, we're currently hovering around $27 an ounce. What's your outlook on the current silver market? Well, uh, sil you know, silver is a very interesting metal you know, compared to gold. It's a monetary asset like gold. And it's got, of course, the huge industrial demand that really can influence the price a lot too. But that industrial demand gives that, metal a lot of inelasticity and i think that's why when you get into a real a sustained precious metal market you eventually see uh in this in this in the cycle where silver really overshoots gold and that's where you see the silver gold ratio or gold to silver ratio could go from 85 where it is now down to 35. And we saw that the last time silver went to its old uh, highs of around fifty dollars, and, uh, and you know, I firmly believe we're going to see that again. I think it's going to see those highs and then then shoot beyond. Um, you know, for the first time in a long time, we've had several years of deficit uh, building there, and um, which is uh, you know a pretty interesting scenario entering into what we think is a precious metal bull market. Okay. Um, I guess you just completed your financing, Jim. So how much cash do you currently have and uh, what's your current burn rate like? So we've got, uh, let's see, once uh, everything clears, we're going to have about 12 million. And um, we we the budget for the 20,000 meters of drilling is going to be about 6 million and then there's going to be about another 1.8 um, you know, general working capital there for the next 12 months and uh, and so that's yeah that's where we sit now depending on that next phase of drilling and whatnot we can you know accelerate and get ourselves heading hopefully towards another resource a maiden resource, a resource update, and a PEA. It's kind of the objective here, but we're in a really strong position here for the next 12 months. Okay. Um, I guess, can you talk about engagement with the local and indigenous groups? Yeah, so we've got uh, no local indigenous groups here. We have a local ahito and landowners that we deal with. And we've developed a real good relationship here because we've been operating now, it's 2024. We got going there in 2019, so five years, going on five years. And we're just uh, about to close and register on a long-term agreement for access here that will allow exploration and exploitation. That's not 100% um, final yet, but we're about to uh, get that. We're in the stages of having it registered. And uh, so we've got sort of three uh, parts here with, with there's one ahito over the whole group and then there's some parcel land that's privately owned and uh, th then um, 
parcel of land that's still in the Hito. So we ended up with three act, different access agreements here. Real good, great relationships with the Hito and the uh, local surface owners. So I, I guess on that note, then can you talk about um, permitting as well? Uh, like how long does it take to get a mine permitted in Mexico? Well, it, it um, let's see when the last mine that I know of, I think was uh, one of the most recent, it was El Camino, uh, Orla. So probably took them about two, three, three years to permit it. So what you would do is once we get onto our path with uh, P, well, even currently now, we'll be expanding our environmental surveys and start doing water testing and uh, year year round monitoring to go into uh, the environmental impact that you have to submit for a mine permit ultimately. So some of that longer lead time stuff begins now for us, and so that helps shorten shorten that time frame. And um, it, you know it's relatively quick in Mexico once you get a get get an asset that. that 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 warrants being brought into production all right so i think that's it uh for questions jim but maybe before we wrap up could you give us a final uh pitch of your key catalyst that investors should be looking for in the next few months yeah it's going to be drilling so we we've been drilling here for almost i think about three four weeks now sorry and so with, within the next one to two weeks, I expect there to be enough assays back to start putting results out. We are getting everybody organized to bring a second drill in. And uh, the objective here is to get in the next 20,000 meters done. And I think that's going to be enough for maiden resource. We certainly want that maiden resource to be of a meaningful enough size. And, and so we're going to be having real consistent drill news coming out here from now till the end of the year. Okay, great. I think we had one last question come in um, as you were answering that. So do you see uh, foresee industrial users of silver potentially taking stakes in mines to secure future supply? I mean, that, I suppose that could happen. Uh, especially if they start to feel a squeeze, and um, it's not—it's not like lithium. I mean, there's sufficient supply at the at the moment, but like I mentioned, there is a, a deficit running. So, yeah, yeah. silver. The majority of silver production comes off of production of as a byproduct of other mines, lead, zinc, uh, copper, usually, and so um, you know. I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, it's a little bit different than some of the other uh, uh, critical minerals, uh, such as lithium, where there, you know, there's not a lot of, uh, there are not a lot of mines in production there, so that there was a lot of tightness until recently on, on that supply side. Um, so, yeah. I, I suppose it could happen. It's not. It's. it's um, I have to think about that a little more. Uh, about the ability to, you know, the ability to expand production, and whatnot, uh, with the silver price, it takes time. There's quite a lag time. So you know, you, you, you could get into a situation, I suppose, where, where there's strategic investments to, 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 to uh, secure a. The supply right okay well i think that concludes the q a portion of the webinar jim thank you very much for taking time to host this with us today thanks just, Lena. appreciate that just as a reminder for our participants our next webinar will feature aris resources and that's thursday may 2nd at 4 p.m eastern thanks for tuning in with us everyone have a great day